Mr. Lassiter. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Well, again, I'm very privileged to be back with you, and thank you again for coming out for this fabulous raffle. Wow, I didn't even know I could have bought a ticket. <laughs> oh, dear. The title of my talk for today is The Holy Eucharist as the Antidote to Modern Ills, but I, I thought I had the word crisis, modern crisis, and I was, I was fiddling around with the word crisis because... Um, well, traveling abroad is always a crisis for me. Uh, never easy to travel. I don't sleep on planes. And uh, I was accompanying uh, this gentleman who I have uh, been uh, working with for a little while, Michael Voris. And the two of us set out from Detroit. I have been involved with Michael for a couple of years, and uh, uh, he's a few years older than I am. And as we were traveling along, we left L.A., and we got to Australia, and it had been given to me the responsibility to uh, make arrangements for a flight from Sydney to Auckland. And he always flies Delta. Oh, we have to fly Delta because Delta, he is a diamond member, so uh, it is a very important person, I guess. So I had to make the arrangements from Auckland to Sydney and Sydney to Auckland, so I, I found one of these very cheap flights. <laughs> A very cheap one. I was so impressed with my ability online to find a cheap flight. But apparently it's cheap because you have to pay for even bringing your toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> and when you travel with uh, an American who was a movie star, uh, they bring all sorts of suitcases and hat boxes and, and all sorts of things. And, and I was under the impression that this was all uh, video equipment. Uh, but I have a sneaking suspicion it was a lot of beauty products. <laughs> and he was joshing me as we were getting through this terrible crisis, because we were paying for every pound, that I was falling apart. I mean, as a priest, I mean, I don't have that many beauty products. So in the midst of this terrible travel, I am beginning to fall apart, you see. 33 hours in the air and you start to decompose. But I had one thing that he did not have. I had this fabulous, splendid Akubra, an authentic Akubra, that I had received from marrying a young couple. She had been from Australia, and she, she got me this Akubra. And it had always been sitting on my shelf, and I thought, I'm going to wear that. I'm going to bring it with me on this trip. So as I was exiting the beautiful Auckland airport, this lovely New Zealand lady came running up to myself and Voris with a camera. <laughs> she didn't want his picture. <laughs> she wanted mine, see? <laughs> the Kubra had set her off. She said, I want a picture with you in that hat. And Voris said, oh, I, I can take the picture. So this lady who remains, I don't know her name, she stood beside me and I was smiling, looking ever bad the wear, for I had been in the air for so long, I didn't even know where I was. And Voris took the picture, and the lady turned to him and to me, and she said to, to me, speaking of him, it was very nice that your father took the picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, he said it was the other way around, but that couldn't possibly be true. <laughs> no. The Blessed Eucharist is the antidote to the modern crisis, and it is a crisis. Let me give you a little bit of a history of who I am. I was born in 1971 to a very modest rural country family in southwestern Ontario. I am the youngest of seven boys. I surprised the daylights out of my poor parents. <laughs> my father was 55 and my mother was 44. and They didn't think they were going to have any more children. And then I, I was announced. <laughs> oh, my, my goodness, my poor father, God love him, God rest him. Uh, when uh, they were baptizing me, uh, the very cheeky parish priest said to my father, he said, uh, when you get this boy raised, you'll be saying, huh, what did you say? <laughs> I can assure you that if I said things like that today, those people would leave the church. <laughs> but my father took it all in good stead. 
And I was named Paul uh, for the Holy Father, Pope Paul VI, because in those difficult years, our Holy Father, Pope Paul VI, issued what was known as that landmark encyclical called Humanae Vitae. And my parents were simple Catholics. Uh, they didn't have the ability to read everything that came from Rome, but they knew enough. They had heard things. And so when the doctor intimated and suggested something to my parents when I was in utero, that now in Canada, thanks to John Turner and the omnibus bill of 1969, that well, with a little bit of signature from certain doctors, there could be a solution to this surprise. Huh? Mm. And my parents would have nothing to do with anything of the sort. And so they were actually given bad suggestion, bad example by a doctor. You would expect that someone like that you would automatically believe. People believe their doctors just like that. But in that circumstance, thanks be to God, I thank God, my parents did not even blink for a moment. They said, oh no, it didn't matter how you arrived or what you were. We wanted you the moment we found out about you. And so my parents called me Paul after Pope Paul VI. And to his credit, to his honor, I stand here today to tell you to tell you that that far-seeing prophet saw the coming crisis. He saw it against everyone's better suggestion. He did what Peter has always done. He sees far afield. He can tell the encircling gloom because Christ has promised to Peter what he has promised to no one else. I am with you always until the close of the age. Satan has demanded to sift you, but I have prayed for you, Peter. I have prayed for you that you may go and strengthen your brethren. And while certain churchmen of certain kinds perhaps suggested to the good and holy father that he might be well advised to do something else and to command something else, by the grace of God, and by the power of the Holy Spirit and the infallibility that is given to our Holy Catholic religion, our Holy Father issued the encyclical on July 28, 1968. I was born in 1971. In 1988, the Supreme Court of Canada issued a ruling on what was known as the Morgan Toller case. This case had taken the omnibus bull of 69 and decided that there was virtually no need for any kind of restriction on abortion. So our country of Canada, entrusted to the honor and the glory of St. Joseph, became one of three countries in the entire world at that point with no legal protection for the little child in its mother's womb. We joined Russia and we joined China. And we stood amongst those great countries and removed all legal protection for the little ones. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm a fighter by nature. I can't exactly accept the possibility of just sitting down and letting things just go. And there was this movement that sprung up in the United States. Leave it to Americans, huh? <laughs> They've got a devilish streak to them. And they came up with this idea, we'll go down to those clinics and we'll sit in front of those clinics and we'll block the clinic doors and give the sidewalk counselors time, time that is so essential to reach those women who are in crisis and give them the alternative. And we called ourselves Operation Rescue. It was very brave, it was very daring. I was 19 years of age. And I decided I was going to go on this, and I had the blessing of a beautiful parish priest. He was venerable and holy, 
and we basically had to carry him to the clinic doors. He was so frail and delicate. God love him. But because of his witness, we went down to the clinics and we'd get arrested and thrown in paddy wagons and trucked off to the Toronto jail and fingerprinted and mugshot. You New Zealanders have all these documents when you come in and leave your country. They ask if you've got any criminal offenses. <laughs> I had to lie. <laughs> what are you going to do? But I remember one day we were sitting in front of that house of horrors, because that's what it is. And I was sitting there thinking about all these things. I knew I'd want to be a priest. I don't even remember when I didn't want to be a priest. It was like, I don't know, I think I was eating pablum and I was saying priest. <laughs> but I was thinking as I was sitting there on the clinic door step, and we were being chained up and taken away by the police, I thought to myself, you know what? As horrible as this is, and there really is nothing worse than this horrible crime, this scourge, I kept thinking to myself, there is something that is just, this is just a symptom of something worse. It is a symptom. We all know what a symptom is. You have a cough, you have a fever, you've got a cold, you've got the flu. You don't just treat a symptom, you go and you try to treat what is the root, what is the root problem. And I had been toying with the idea of doing full-time pro-life work or becoming a priest. But when I had this moment, when I was sitting on that clinic doorstep, I began to realize that I had to become a priest. I had to become a priest. I had to become a priest because only God can solve this problem. And the problem, the crisis is that what we have right now is the worship of a false god. And the worship of the false god is imitating the sacraments of the one true faith. Stay with me. The sermons of the fathers of the church tell us that when the Antichrist appears, he will do the exact replica, but twisted replica of everything that our Lord ever did. That's why he's called the Antichrist. He will look and act and move and perform miracles and do things that are just like Christ. And he will deceive the nations. And when you look at the situation as it stands with this scourge that has afflicted every country on earth. They tell us that Malta and the Philippines are spared, but I have a suspicion that there are evil things even working behind the scenes in those holy places, working, working with a diabolical fury to bring that scourge there too. And you see, if you look at it from the eyes of faith, you realize that it is a diabolical form of worship of a false God because it imitates the sacrifice. In those horrible places where those poor vulnerable women go and their children are destroyed and offered as a sacrifice, a bloody sacrifice, and that's what it is. They have been rejected, they have been abused, they have been violated, and they think that the only way forward, the only redemption, the only way forward is for sacrifice. I must sacrifice. And so they offer the sacrifice. What gave me rise to think that this was all connected to a very diabolical idea, a very diabolical plan, was on January 31st, 2012, this year, there was this lovely little institution called Susan G. Komen Foundation. In the United States, they fundraise and they do all sorts of good things 
for breast cancer research. Practically everybody's had someone in their family or they know someone who has been touched by that horrible disease. And the Susan G. Komen Foundation has raised over $2 billion, amazing, with the pink ribbon campaign. And they've gone and done so many good things, but one of the things that was happening was they were funneling some of their money to an institution called Planned Parenthood. And one of these gutsy American gals, and I swear I think the church is going to be saved by an American woman. <laughs> Those gals are tough. She discovered this. And she said, you know what? I don't think I like this. And so, as senior vice president of the Komen Foundation, she pulled the support that they were sending to Planned Parenthood. And hell hath no fury than to scorn the sacrament, the sacrament of this false religion. And it is what happened. They went into the media, they denounced, and they made hell happen for the Komen Foundation. And of course, the foundation did not realize that they were handling the all-holy sacrament. And they pulled back and they said, we will not do anything more. You may not touch. You may not look. You may not do anything to that sacrament. This unholy sacrifice, which is offered to the false god of liberalism. And it is a false god of liberalism because the false god of liberalism desires nothing more than to have the holy sacrifice. It must be offered in every country. It must be offered free of charge. It must be offered in every city. It does not matter. It imitates the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is a mockery of God's most precious gift to us, the laying down of His spotless and immaculate Son offered on the cross in an act of complete self-giving and total and unconditional love. Those women hear nothing of unconditional love upon those altars of sacrifice. Instead, what they are told over and over again, you'll be so much better when you get rid of it. And the magisterium, the magisterium of this liberal religion pronounces in all sorts of encyclicals how women feel relieved and much better because they have done this. Oh. And it is a magisterium. It's another magisterium. It imitates exactly our magisterium. The modern media tells us again and again what it means to be happy. It pronounces all sorts of fiats and encyclicals and statements of truth that if you don't accept it, you're a heretic, you're a loser. If you want to be loved, you better be beautiful. If you want to be accepted, you've got to think this way, you've got to act this way. And our young people from their earliest years are catechized. They know the vocabulary. They understand the message. And the media rises up like an omnipotent magisterium and issues the most powerful fatwas and edicts that you can imagine. So much so that we don't even think about it. And if you look at that schema of this false religion, of this false gods, liberalism, you even see in there this whole idea of communion, oh yeah, and adoration. For is not the Blessed Eucharist in our traditional Catholic teaching identified in three marvelous mysteries? It is sacrifice, it is communion, it is presence. And in a diabolical loathing for this marvelous mystery of God, the false gods of this antichrist religion has the exact same formula. It has the formula of sacrifice in liberal and unrestrained abortion on demand. And then it says, well, you better, you better take communion. 
And they call it contraception. See? Yeah. The contraceptive mentality will not broker any deal. It is the common experience of everyone. Everyone, everyone, everyone. See? The President of the United States and all of the Senate and the Congress simply accept that this is so much part of people's lives that the American government must pay for it. And it doesn't mean that anyone gets to exclude themselves, even the Catholic Church. Because you, Catholic Church, are the opposition. You're the alternative religion, and there is no room for another religion with this false religion of the liberal gods. It imitates exactly what we have always believed. We say that there is only one true church. There is only one faith, one baptism, one Lord. But this false God, this false religion of liberalism will not even allow for any kind of plurality. And so it says to the churches, you will pay for contraceptions and abortifacients. It doesn't matter if it contradicts your conscience. You will most certainly participate in all of this. And when you see that beautiful mystery being mocked of the sacrifice and the communion, you say, well, where is the tabernacle? Where is the sacrament of his abiding presence? And it's in our lives, in our materialistic way of life. From our Mercedes Benz to our house in the Muskokas. We live a life that is leisurely and free of any kind of sacrifice except that horrible sacrifice. But we must have that lifestyle in which we bow down and genuflect before all these things, the material things. I must have these things. In our traditional understanding of the most blessed sacrament, it has always been the Catholic belief that we bestow upon the tabernacle everything that is good. We sacrifice everything for the presence of our Lord in our churches. We make him prominent and we behold him in his tabernacled mystery. But thanks to this newfound liberal religion and the false gods of secularism, we surrender before the tabernacle of the television in our homes and it is duly centered. Oh, there is no search and find for that tabernacle. In this circumstance, the false gods of liberalism knows exactly what it is doing. It is mocking the true religion of Jesus Christ. It is mocking the Eucharistic mystery. And that is when I made this decision. I, I was sitting on this step. I recognized the moment. I can remember it as clear as today when I thought to myself, the only antidote to this modern crisis is the Eucharist. It is the worship of the true living God. It is the offering of the unbloody sacrifice of Calvary. It is to administer the blessed sacrament to the soul that is wounded in the mystery of Holy Communion. And it is to abide with the tabernacled mystery of Jesus Christ in his most abased form, imprisoned in a tabernacle out of love for us. For that is our most precious possession, no matter what anyone says. The only way to overcome the present darkness is by lighting the sanctuary lamp. The only way forward is upon our knees before that mystery. He abides for us so that he may show us his wounds and we might bring our wounds to him. The false religion of liberalism even understands the need for ecstasy and out-of-body transports and it creates the false illusion of an alternative universe that you can live in and move in and have your being in. And it doesn't even have to be just in materialism. You can live in a fantasy 
in an ecstasy perpetual. And now, thanks to the internet, we can imbue ourselves with this God-awful pornography, which does something in a certain way what prayer ought to do, what true loving prayer in the presence of Almighty God is meant to do. It is meant to give us rapture. It is meant to give us ecstasy. It is meant to lift us up. But because the false gods of liberalism have now infested our homes and the sanctuary, the domestic church, we now can only see this place of escape. The only way forward can be found in Jesus' church. This is the sanctuary. This is Noah's ark. The deluge is upon us, brothers and sisters. The crisis is here. But we ought not to be terrified or overwhelmed or taken up in despair. Our Lord has left everything, everything, everything for us in the most blessed Eucharist, in the holy sacraments of our religion, in the magisterium founded upon Peter, the rock. And though I am with you always, even unto the close of the ages, did our blessed Lord see this age awash with the blood of innocent children, broken homes in which the destabilized family can barely find its strength forward, where the head of the family, the father's head, is cut off and made a mockery of, a joke. Have you seen a television program of late where a man in the home has anything decent to say? He's made into a joke. He's a jerk. And that's because the magisterium of liberalism will not tolerate the proper order established by God in which the family is best served by a father who imitates Christ. It knows and it understands that it must remove the head if it is to create disorder. And that is to say nothing of how it mocks the sacred priesthood and how it has created this terrible suspicion that lingers around us. Visiting a lovely family here in New Zealand, I could not help but from time to time catch myself, thinking to myself, I wonder if they think I'm odd for being so cheerful and happy with their children. Isn't that awful? But that is exactly what has happened. An atmosphere of suspicion has so terrorized us that we feel ourselves often like we are those in the upper room with the doors locked and we don't know what to do but our Lord comes to us today on this divine mercy and he's the only real one he's reality and he shows us his hands and his feet and the side that is opened by the lance by the sword and he takes us by the hand and he brings us out of this fantasy out of this horrible nightmare and he points us to the Eucharist and tells us this is where the truth is this is where reality is certainly this false religion that now encircles everywhere in the whole wide world it gives you this impression that you you are nothing it gives you the idea that you have to escape but I will show you that in my heart and in my Eucharistic mystery, I give, you a new, I give you a new day. I give you the future. A future that is full of hope. Don't get discouraged, brothers and sisters. You may think to yourself, how will we ever overcome these things? We've overcome these things before. We buried Rome! And we Christianized it! and we made it our own. We have nothing to fear. We have been given everything by our Lord. He has not fallen asleep in the boat. He is here every single day, and he gives himself to us so that we go out and we do wonderful things in his name. He allows himself to be locked in a tabernacle 
so that we will go forth and be his messengers of his mercy. That's what our Lord wants of us. He wants us to proclaim this new day. And you who are in New Zealand hold a special responsibility because you are the, you are the watchman of the new day. Every new day starts here. And with that glory, you are the watchman, and you hold the hope for the church universal. Let it be here that the battle lines are drawn. And let the start of the new day begin here, where the rarefied, glorified Christ crushes and destroys these false gods, these false altars of liberalism and secularism. All right, then, I've told you enough of all that. And I'm going to tell you a funny story now. <laughs> Just because I'm the last on the list, i got to make you laugh. <laughs> so here's how it goes. <laughs> In 2008, I did visit New Zealand before. I came here on my way through to Australia for World Youth Day. Oh, that was a great World Youth Day. I have done seven World Youth Days, and the best was over there. But I think the best is yet to come here in New Zealand. <laughs> and as we were going along, I had thought to myself, it's not good to just take kids on a big, expensive trip to Australia. I'm going to plan, and I'm going to organize a very nice project, a social project for the kids that they can go and spend their World Youth Day graces by doing something wonderful for others. So I thought, I will have to find a place where there is real poverty and real hardship, so I chose Papua New Guinea. <laughs> huh? I said, that's the place to go. But then I discovered, through my travel agent, that I had to pay three times the amount because I had 178 teenagers and they could not accommodate all of us on one plane. I said, look it, I'm bringing 178 teenagers. I should go for free. <laughs> so I had to do some fast peddling and change things. And so I found out through Facebook, it was a great place to meet people, I met this young woman who decided to tell me that I should go to Fiji and do a service project. Well, that was my response. I wanted to clap because I didn't even know there was hardship in Fiji. I thought there was only beautiful resorts and beaches. Oh, yeah. So I thought that would be the place to go. So we worked and worked and made our way to Fiji. We went to two lovely isolated villages and we were doing some beautiful work. But as soon as we got off the plane, oh my, my kids, they're all dairy farmers and pig farmers, and they've got ambition to burn. So the first day they jumped right into the job, and they fell down sick the next day, all 170 of them. Oh, I was the only one who was able to stay the course, you see, but when you're sitting down relaxing watching what the work is being done it's, it's not hard to get sick <laughs> I said to the kids okay you all get better put yourself back on track and I'll promise one day we'll go to the beach well they revived they jumped out of their beds and they went back to work I had brought with me five priests and five nuns we were quite a happy bunch with it. And these lovely little nuns, they were so sweet and pious. And they came to me secretly by night, like Nicodemus, to our Lord. <laughs> and they said to me, that wasn't a good idea to go to the beach. And I said, why not? And they said, oh, Father, it'll be an occasion of sin. They'll go out there in their beach attire, and they'll want to see all the things that are going on. I said, sister, we're Canadians. We wear our long underwear everywhere. <laughs> that does not please a religious sister to be spoken to in such cheeky manner. I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? The kids got their hearts set on it. It's the only way I could get them out of bed to go back to work. What am I going to do? Well, they very imperiously folded their arms and walked away. 
the day came and the sun rose and I thought it was going to be splendid. But by 7.30 in the morning, it seemed as if the clouds rushed in and the heavens opened. <laughs> and they told me they had never seen rain like that in 12 years in Fiji. <laughs> I said to the sisters, what did you do? And the mother superior said, well, I spoke to you and you wouldn't listen. So I spoke to him and he did. Well, there was no occasion of sin, let me tell you. Those children came out like drowned kittens, all in their beach attire. And we got to this lovely resort. It was beautiful, but rainy. And we were having the loveliest time. And the kids said to me, they said, Father, you should come out with us into the ocean and come swimming. And I said, well, I don't know how to swim. And they said, you don't have to know how to swim. It's salt water. You just float. <laughs> and I said, really? I never knew that. <laughs> well, I got the flippers on and the snorkel on and the goggles on, and I forbid them under penalty of sin not to take a picture. And I waded out into the beautiful Pacific Ocean off the coast of Fiji, and I lie down and I began to float. <laughs> now, I'm a man of a certain size, and I can tell you I haven't had that experience for a very, very long time. Floating, it was paradise. I mean, Fiji, off the coast of Fiji, floating, it was magnificent. And I was out there, five minutes turned into 10 minutes, and 10 minutes turned into 12 minutes, and 15 minutes, I thought, this, I have never had this happen. This is the most gorgeous experience of my entire life. And just then, this beautiful school of fish, all transparent and beautiful, that God has blessed Fiji with, they all swam underneath me, and they were waving their little fins at me. <laughs> And I waved back and I dipped my head underneath and I thought, I'm gonna look, oh, I should not do that. And I pulled my head up and realized I had water in the snorkel. And I thought, oh, that's not good. And I pulled it off and then I thought, I shouldn't pull this out. This is not good either. I don't know how to swim. And then I began to realize I'm on the wrong side here. I'm flipped upside down. And I began <laughs> to panic. And you know you never panic when you don't know how to swim. Hmm? People have told you that. Okay, so I began to realize I was in trouble. And the first thought, of course, is that, oh my goodness, what is my mother going to say? She's going to say, he didn't know how to swim. What was he thinking? <laughs> and I began to flail, thinking that would help things, because I'd seen people swimming before. And I flipped and I... And then I saw this young priest that I had brought with me. He was the youngest, newest ordained priest of the Diocese of London. And you know, I, I, I really hate young priests after that. <laughs> he's got muscles on muscles, standing there looking like he's a lifeguard. <laughs> and I thought, well, you're posing for men's health. Get over here and help me. <laughs> so I said, help me. And I went down into the water, and I got water in my nose and water in my ears. I was all panicked and frustrated. I didn't know what to do. And I came back up, and there he was, standing like this lacquered peacock. <laughs> and I said, get over here and help me. I'm drowning. And I went back down and flailing like a great jellyfish. And I came back up. I thought, I'm going to die off the coast of Fiji. And I yelled. I said, help me. I'm drowning. He said, well, just stand up. I was only, I was only in three feet of water, you see. But I was so certain I was drowning. Does not our Lord do the same to us? In this great and terrible hour in the church's greatest need, when we think everything is so bad, don't be deceived. 
Don't let the devil tell you things are bad. Things are bad, but they're not that bad. Because we have a lifeguard, and he has risen from the dead, and he has come to us in mercy. And all he's telling us every time we receive Holy Communion, he tells us, stand up. Stand up. Let me give you my blessing before I go. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.